Well, good evening. The theme of this evening, unusual leadership, I, I think is a rather daunting one, actually, because it's been discussed leadership for centuries. I mean, even Plato addressed the topic. So I really don't have anything much to add, except I have some personal musings and some opinions. One of them is which I, I believe that the fundamental nitty-gritty essence of an unusual leader is that he or she has stayed wedded to an idea that they simply cannot shake. And no matter the odds against them or their project, no matter how daunting or seemingly impossible or far-fetched their idea might seem, they don't see it that way. In fact, I don't think that they even view it as challenging. I think they view it as sort of like a, they're compelled to bring this idea to life, whether it be um, to land a man on the moon, to bring about a social change, to reinvent the wheel or build a better mousetrap. But unless the person is morally corrupt or has their designs on being a despot, their drive is never towards self-aggrandizement or material gain. Now imagine, if you will, all the little sperm struggling up the vagina on their way to meet up with the egg. And as they go, they're squealing, Ooh, I want to be an engineer. I want to be a ballet dancer. I want to be an astrophysicist. Not one is squealing that it wants to be an unusual leader, because unusual leaders emerge, and usually very reluctantly. The a quality that's common to all leaders is their ability to take risks. And I actually don't think it can be termed an ability, because the word ability denotes skill. And I think they see it more as this path, there's no alternative to it. Nikos Kazantzakis, the Greek author, said to always choose the sure thing. Now listen up. This is a great tattoo to get if you want a tattoo. <laughs> to always choose the sure thing is treason for the soul. In other words, to always go towards what we know to be right, safe, and comfortable does not stretch us. There's no risk involved, no adventure, no growth. And I know for myself, when I have gone yet again to something I know is sure, safe, and comfortable, because I don't want to risk, I, either out of fear of the unknown or to avoid upsetting others, I always feel sort of slightly diminished, like I've sold out somehow. And those people that we, it's only usually in hindsight that we view those who have chosen an unsure path as extraordinary. Now take, for instance, um, Thomas Edison, who we have to thank for this. He had a vision that the electric light and motion pictures were a possibility. His friends thought he was crazy, and his experiments constantly were exploding. But he persevered, and we have light. Um, take uh, on another level someone like Oskar Schindler, who gave his entire fortune and risked his life to rescue over a 1,000 Jews from the Nazi death camps. Take um, uh, Judy Shepard just an ordinary housewife who was propelled out of her comfort zone by the brutal murder of her son, Matthew, because he was gay. And she was responsible to, uh, she overcame many hurdles to, of getting the uh, LGBT community included in the hate crimes bill. And ladies, we owe a great debt of gratitude to Coco Chanel, who um, was considered extremely scandalous in her day because she released women from the tight constraints of corsets. 
actually, I could do with one of those now myself. <laughs> but um, uh, each one took a risk. Each one stepped out of their safety zone and thereby enhanced the human condition. And rarely is it given to any one of those people to see. We know there are legions of others in all sorts of areas. But rarely is it given to, for them to see um, the impact of their action at the time. I mean, take Rosa Parks. She refused to relinquish her seat on the bus to a white passenger, as was the law in Montgomery, Alabama in 1955. And that act of defiance on an ordinary day, on an ordinary bus ride, was to galvanize the civil rights movement. And later she said that it was for her it was a crossroads moment. She was just tired of giving in. And no matter the consequences, she would not move. Now, my experiences have not been quite of that heroic variety. But in 1970, I was in the 70s, sorry, I was working at Sotheby's, the art auction house, and I was an expert in a particular area of Japanese art. And my job was to bring items together and put a sale together. And at the time of the actual auction, I had to hand over this entire project to an auctioneer who knew not a thing about the items being sold or the prospective buyers. And I felt increasingly divorced from this and, and increasingly kind of upset. And I determined to ask if I could be an auctioneer. Now, at this time, South of this was over 230 years old. It had been founded in London in 1740. George Washington was 12. I think it was 1744, he was 12. And uh, of course, never had a woman stepped in to conduct an auction. So I had absolutely no delusions about my chances of doing this. But I thought, I have to at least ask. I worked on my speech for quite a long time. And then, of course, I called the president to make an appointment with him. I worked on this speech. And then, of course, he was going to say, no, don't be so ridiculous. And so I crafted a response as to why I thought he ought to reconsider. The day came, and I was, I was sick with nerves. And I, but I felt that no matter how much I was ridiculed by my co-workers, and they thought me absolutely mental, I had to go. I had to go and at least ask. So I went into his office, sat down, and I just launched into my pitch. And when I'd finished, he leaned back in his chair and he went, hmm, you know, I think that's a great idea. Let's start your training next week. Well, I mean, I was stunned. But breaking out of my safety and risking was to launch my career in a whole new direction. And not only did I become the first woman art auctioneer in America, the news of which and a picture of myself was in every newspaper across the land, I became a top flight auctioneer. And a few years ago, I was cast playing myself in the first Sex and the City movie. I mean, that's a dubious accolade, but still, there, there <laughs> we have it. So it seemed that I had arrived. It seemed that life was on an upward trend, but I was feeling increasingly empty and trapped. And I love New England's motto, live free or die. And I knew I wasn't free, that something inside me was dying. And I came to grips with the fact that I was in the grips of alcohol. And I was drinking and I was alcoholic. I reached out for help, and help arrived in the form of other people who had had a problem with alcohol. And they helped me embark on a life of sobriety, 
which was essentially based on spiritual principles and, of course, helping others. So life got sweeter and wider and broader and finer. And then when I was about five years sober, life was really rather terrific. I had lots of friends, a good job, everything was in divine right order. Someone gave me a book about Mother Teresa of Calcutta. Now, I can assure you, I wasn't the slightest bit interested in reading about this do-good little nun halfway around the world. But the book had lots of pictures and large print. So I thought, all right, I'll read it. Then, um, by the time I finished, I was totally intrigued. And I, here was a woman who was full of joy, whose entire life was devoted to helping others. And I thought, I want to go and see. I want to see what that kind of focus, that devotion and love, what does it look like in reality? I wanted to see those leprosarians and the food centers and the orphanages. I wanted to see that. So I picked up the phone and I booked a round trip ticket to Calcutta. Now, I think God rendered me temporarily insane. I really do. But anyway, I, having read the book, I knew that the nuns in Calcutta needed an auctioneer like a hole in the head. So I didn't dare write and say I was coming because I was sure they were going to write back and say, look, don't bother unless you're a nurse. But however, the money you were thinking of spending on your fare, send that to us. I thought, no, I'm not going to give them my money. I'm going to go. So off I went. I, went. I got on this plane and I went to Calcutta. And I had absolutely no idea what to expect. I'd never traveled to um, a third world country before. I'd, I just hadn't been in, the, in Asia or South America. And, um, but I felt at the time that unless I risked it, unless I sort of went out of the safety of my Sotheby New York cocoon, I would always regret it. I'd always regret and feel that I'd missed this opportunity. I never thought I'd meet with Mother Teresa or anything, but I just wanted to see. And that stepping out of my comfort zone was to be the first of many trips to India. Uh, over the years, a close personal relationship with Mother Teresa, writing a book. In fact, I wrote two after she died. And in 2004, I was called by the Vatican to be a witness for her beatification, which is the first process in becoming a saint. Um, she was interesting, to say the least. <laughs> and um, she had some interesting qualities. One of the ones of, about leadership is she had this very organized mind. I really think she could have run General Motors or the Pentagon or something. But she also had a quality that's common with um, unusual leaders is that she was always willing to put her hand to anything she asked others to do. And I remember once arriving in Calcutta, and I had lots of boxes for the missionaries of charity that was full of supplies. And there was no one to meet me. So I called the mother house. And in the mother house, at any given time, there were about 100 women living. And this little voice answered the phone. Hello? Mother? Yes? Mother, this is Lorna. I'm at the airport. Why on earth are you answering your own phone? Oh, everyone's so busy. Now, can you imagine calling the White House? Hello? Mr. President, how come you're answering the phone? Oh, everyone's a little tied up right now. I thought I'd give them a hand. Um, I don't think so. Anyway, we all know that the path of those people we consider very successful or not so that, but unusual and have broken through different kind of barriers is often littered with seeming failures. Look at Nelson Mandela. He was in prison for almost three decades and even behind bars. He was an inspirational leader. And because I am a recovering alcoholic, one of my particular heroes is a guy called Bill Wilson. And 
Bill Wilson was a hopeless drunk. He was a New York stockbroker, and in 1934, he was just destitute, and he got, but he got sober. And um, his sobriety was contingent on him helping others. And when he was about six months sober, he was moaning to his wife. He said, you know, I've been talking to these men for six months, and no one has stayed sober. It's not working. And she said, yes, Bill, but you've stayed sober. So that was the key for him. So at six months sobriety, he was um, on a trip to Akron, Ohio, with a few business friends, and they were going to seal this deal that was going to be the answer for his prayer. He was out of money. His wife was working at Macy's. So this was the answer. He, the deal fell through. <laughs> and that night, he's in the Mayflower Hotel in Akron, Ohio, in the lobby. His friends had left. He's standing there. A failure. This deal's gone through. Feelings of hopelessness and despair. He's on thin ice. Over there, on a mezzanine level, there's the sure thing. There's a cocktail bar and a drink. And a drink would get him out of this god-awful day. And just here, behind him, on the wall, was a telephone and next to the telephone was a church directory, the unsure thing. And Wilson stood there, and he struggled. He was in his late 30s, and he struggled, the sure, the unsure. And finally, he turned, and he went towards that telephone, and he started making phone calls. And the last name on that list put him in touch with the family of a guy called Dr. Bob, and Dr. Bob's family were despairing of this Dr. Bob ever getting sober. He too was a drunk. And they were pulling their hair out. And Bill explained that he was a recovering alcoholic and that he needed to talk to another drunk in order to maintain his sobriety. And that family were like, oh, wow, great, great. And they set up a meeting between him and Dr. Bob. And Dr. Bob was not happy at all about this, and very grumpily. He didn't want to talk to this uppity New York stockbroker. And very grumpily, he said, all right, I'll give him 15 minutes. The two men came together, and Bill Wilson stayed in Dr. Bob's house for two weeks. And out of their shared despair and <coughs> agony about drinking and their shared stories and laughter, Alcoholics Anonymous was born. And Alcoholics Anonymous has been responsible for saving the lives of millions worldwide and repairing families and many 12-step offshoot programs. Now, I believe that heaven is very respectful of our free will. It never forces itself upon us but it holds its breath, wondering which way will we choose? The bar, the telephone, and thereby hung the fate of thousands. So, would you not agree that Nikos Kazantzakis was right to always choose the sure thing is treason for the soul. Thank you.